Okay, the year is 1848, and that's where we left off. Uh, before we had the uh, second midterm, uh, we had the Treaty of Guadalupe Hildago, and that been the states of Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, then California. Going back uh, to the east, it's uh, Nevada, Utah, and large part of Colorado. Okay, and so we met with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hildago in 1848. Well, in uh, late 1848, uh, I think it says January 1848. This should be December 1848. In a, late 1848, there was a uh, gold was discovered in Sutter's Mill, which is in Northern California. Okay, just stopped there outside of Sacramento, and uh, it was just a scene floating down the bottom of this creek. But he reached down there, and they were like, "Okay, what the heck is this stuff?" And the gold rushes on. Well, immediately, uh, it sparks a gold rush in 1849 when word got back to um, the East Coast. And a huge number of people started moving west. Now, simultaneous to that, and through the rest of the 1800s, is going to be a land rush into the Oregon Territory. And for those of you who do not know this, between the Cascades and the Pacific Ocean, that is to say, kind of parallel to the coast, about, I don't know, 150, 200 miles inland, the land itself is like really, really super rich. Lots and lots of trees. Uh, the soil is like really, really dark lots of rain, there's like tons and tons of rain, it rains all the time up there and so you just throw some seeds out and that stuff grows so there was a huge land rush into the Oregon Territory simultaneously uh, going on with the gold run 1848-1849 so we have to draw a couple of threads here uh, number one obviously was the Treaty of Guadalupe Hildago, number two was is, is the uh, Northwest Ordinance 1787 if you recall it takes 30,000 voters to become a territory and 60,000 voters to become a state. Well, as you can apprehend, and you can kind of see that in the picture there in the uh, lower right, that's San Francisco Harbor. Now, Los Angeles and San Diego in Southern California, those will not become important cities until late in the 20th century, really in the mid 20th century, okay? So when we take a look at California, the big city that was really, really important was San Francisco. And if you'll take a look at that picture, you'll see these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of ships that are just crowding the harbor. And so these are guys that are getting on the ships on the East Coast and insisting on passage to the West. And then even the crews are basically abandoning these ships and heading for the gold field. So we get to our 60,000 people virtually overnight. So along that then... Uh, California gets their territorial governorship and then they submit their constitution like really, really fast. And in 1850, they get ready to come in as another state. Now, the next map will show this really strongly, but what's important about this is this begins to upset the balance of power in the Senate between northern free states and southern slave states. California is going to be a, a free state. There is no agriculture there that's suitable to slavery. There are no black people in, in California. So there's just not going to be any slavery in California. California is going to want to come in as a free state. So let's uh, get to the next slide, uh, which is uh, the U.S. by 1860. And this is just a map to show you kind of where we're going with this thing, uh, the growth of the United States heading into the Civil War. Okay, so again, you can see there in uh, California and the Oregon Territory in 1859 and 1850 to 1859, uh, all these states have come in, and um, especially California, and that begins to upset the balance of power in the Senate. Uh, Michigan comes in in 1837, Wisconsin in 1848, um, um, what, Iowa in 1846, and Texas comes in in 1845, and then Arkansas in 1836, and then um, Florida in 1845. But as you can see, there are no other states, slave states, that are bound to come in farther west. New Mexico, Arizona, uh, there's no pea bear, there's no, there's no agriculture there, nobody's going to come in in those states. Utah, uh, Nevada, there's no people there, there's no agriculture there, so those states are going to come for a long, long time. Washington will eventually come in, but it's all about lugging up there, and it's going to take years for that to come on into the Union. That'll be after the Civil War. So these new states have come in, especially California, and right away the balance of power is upset in the Senate. Now this is a stress on the um, the compromise of uh, 1821, the compromise. That's what is at stress here. So I just want to give you a big overview of what the United States look like heading into the Civil War. Uh, let's go on to the next slide, and what we're going to talk about is the beginning of the end 
for the Missouri Compromise of 1821. Now, the first big issue that chisels away at um, the uh, Missouri Compromise, which was in 1821, what that, what the Missouri, as a reminder, what the Missouri Compromise did was keep the Civil War from happening all the way back then, because the Southern states could see how they were going to continue to have power in the Senate. They were going to have, and they were pretty sure they were going to keep the presidency, which was true. Uh, the presidents up until this time, uh, whether they're Pierce, Hyler, Taylor, uh, um, Buchanan, uh, James K. Polk, they were either Southern or they were very much Southern leaning in their sympathies, okay? So the House of Representatives, that will always belong to the North. The presidency, the South is pretty confident about that. But the Senate, that's where the problem is at. So the Conference of 1850. Now, these news are earning from the Western territories, and that creates an imbalance in the Senate. And the South is getting really, really paranoid about losing control in the Senate because they feel the very next thing will be an abolition or a limitation, a very severe limitation on slavery. And that, as, as we know, is the labor for the South. And they just don't see how that's going to work out. Uh, there's a, a, a significant fear politically that the South is going to lose uh, votes if blacks are freed. The very next thing that's going to happen is they're going to get control of some of the land, at least, and then they're going to get the vote, and then they'll start out voting the white population. So the South really, really paranoid about this. I mean, they're just really, really are getting uh, to a state of, vir of virtual hysteria about this issue of slavery as we're going towards the Civil War. Now, the next bullet point there, no new state wants to enter as a slave state, even though they might be below the 3630 line. But again, there's just no, you know, California part of that was below the 3630 line, but they didn't want to enter as a slave state. New Mexico, there's no um, agriculture there for slavery. There are no black people there. Arizona, same thing. There are no black people there. There is no agriculture suitable for slavery. So this imbalance is going to be a fact of life. So what happens is a deal gets cut. Now, I have the next three bullet points are in no particular order. These just happen to be the deals that got cut. So the first one, uh, the North states were really, really upset. Their senators, their congressmen were really, really upset that slaves were being sold in Washington, D.C. Foreign dignitaries, foreign ambassadors uh, were, were there in Washington, D.C., and the better sort of people from the north would come down to D.C. to take care of business. And they did not want to see slave markets, you know, just literally just down the street from Executive Mansion or just around the corner from the Capitol building. They did not like that. So they insisted that, the north did, they insisted that there was going to be no slaves uh, to be sold in Washington, D.C. Now... The South right away gets very suspicious about this. I feel that this is um, a slippery slope. That if the North can cause a limitation on slavery in Washington, D.C., they can then legally cause a, li a limit on slavery anywhere. But text kind of breaks the ice and says, listen, we need a deal, and we're willing to give the North what they want on this in order to get what we want. And their deal was, and this is Texas, okay, slave state. Texas needed money, even deep in debt. Uh, they had debt left over from uh, the time they were a republic. And as a state, they were just running a huge deficit. And so Texas said, okay, you know what? We'll let you have your uh, limitation on slavery in Washington, D.C., but we will give, we want, we need this debt relieved. So give us $10 million, and you'll get your limitation on slavery in Washington, D.C., and Texas says, we'll sweeten the pot by throwing in. Uh, get, getting rid of land claims. Texas was at that stage claiming virtually everything up to Wyoming. That is to say, all of uh, eastern Colorado, all the way to basically Casper, modern day Casper and Wyoming. And so they, they were claiming a huge bunch of land, but they had no people there. And of course, there wasn't going to be any people there for a long, long time. Okay, it's Solano Estacado and the staked plains, and it's really, really desolate up there. So, once Texas breaks the, breaks the ice on this for the South, then the rest of the South kind of chimes in, and we'll get to those guys in just a minute, they're, they're pictured there below, with the Fugitive Slave Act. And this end is to placate the South. So, the idea here, and you can read the bullet points, the idea here is that Southern slave catchers were going to be allowed to go anywhere they wanted to in the North in pursuit of runaway slaves. 
Now, think in terms of practical application here. There is no um, fingerprints. There are no uh, you know fingerprint records. No photo ID. There's nothing like that. So slave catchers had to go basically on a, a description. And oh, how do you describe a black person? You know, a, they, their skin is really dark. Eyes are dark. Uh, dark hair, and that's you know. Well, that could be anybody. So these slave catchers were going to the north, basically throwing a bag over anybody's head that they find, any you know African American they find, and kind of knocking them on the head with a stick, loading up their wagon with these unfortunate, brutally kidnapped victims, and taking them back down to the south. And if they happen to be the right individual, you know, they'd get the reward and go on. But think what happened if the slave catcher just grabbed somebody off the street and taken them down to the south. They could simply sell the guy and make their money back, you know, for the transportation costs. On top of that, as you can see from that last book point there, this has to be enforced by federal agents. In other words, the slave catchers could not be hindered in their office. So this was like, imagine what's gone in the north and I want to um, expose you guys to sort of a thesis statement here and I want you to make a good song note on that and I'll try and uh, reinforce this as we go along and thesis is and it's really the beginning of the break that leads to the Civil War in 1860 what will the South do in order to preserve slavery and really the answer is they're going to do anything so here we have the Fugitive Slave Act uh, with the Compromise of 1850, and this is I mean, this is just unconstitutional. You just look at it and you know that this is wrong. You can't just grab somebody off the street. There have been free blacks in the North since before the Revolution. So, and New York had manumitted all their slaves in the 1700s, late 1700s. So there were lots and lots, of, well, not lots of free slaves, but most people in the North who were of African descent were free, and they'd been free. They were born that way. So you can imagine that this is outrageous. And North begins to see just how far the South is ready, willing, and able to go in order to preserve slavery. And, and again, the real answer to that is they'll do anything. The South will do anything. So they get this unconstitutional law, and they begin to execute it. Slaves are dragged down to the South. Or, you know, black people are dragged down to the South and either re-enslaved or basically you know, kidnapped and just sold into slavery. Now let me draw your attention really quickly to these, uh, the picture of these three guys in the South. And this is the late, as it's called the Great Triumvirate uh, uh, in its later incarnation. And John C. Calhoun and Henry Clay, and they were both kind of from the South. And then we'd run into John C. Calhoun as a war hawk all the way back in the, in, in the uh, uh, War of 1812. And he'd been in government service ever since. Here we are in 1850. Well, John C. Calhoun, he was really the voice of the South. He was the leader of these really kind of radical, uh, extreme conservative Democrats from the South. Henry Clay had also been a Democrat for most of his political career, but it became even too extreme for him. So he kind of switched parties and became a Whig, W-H-I-G. Okay, well, that party was on its way out, and it was becoming you know, weaker and weaker. It was really kind of a cent party. So Henry Clay emerges as the deal maker. His nickname is a great compromiser. He was the guy that was always coming up with that a deal that would kind of save the situation and keep the Civil War from happening. Well, the first individual there is Stephen Douglas, the senator from Illinois, and he is a Northern Democrat. So as a Northern Democrat, and the Democratic Party was very, very strong back in those days, uh, he was conservative, but he could not really support slavery because he was from Illinois. So he's kind of the voice of the moderates on the Democratic side. Uh, Calhoun is uh, the extremist on the Democratic side, and Henry Clay, he's kind of the deal maker, and he's sort of in the middle of this whole thing. Okay? So in 1856, both Clay and Calhoun, they will die. Uh, Stephen Douglas will die as well, but that'll be during the Civil War, so it'll be a few years longer. And, and very tragically for him, because he was still a young man, he was in his mid-40s. But Clay and Calhoun, they were, they were in their 70s, and, and, you know, and, but they died. What's important about that is once these guys die, there's nobody left, especially the Senate, who are willing to make a deal. The Senate is populated by extremists, extremists from the North, who are all uh, abolitionists, uh, abolitionism, and extremists in the South, who are all pro-slavery. Okay, 
Uh, Henry Clay and John C. Calhoun, there's nobody to make a deal with. And sure enough, just a couple of years later, the Civil War breaks out because neither side can make a compromise. No, neither side can come to the table and make a deal. Okay, well now let's go on and talk Kansas and Nebraska Act. Now your book talks about this in really in a separate way, but I'm sort of, just for the purpose of this class, I'm kind of lumping them in together. And this is all about uh, our thesis statement, which is what the South will do, what will the South do in order to preserve slavery. So let's go on and talk about the Kansas and Nebraska Act. Now, the thing of the Kansas and Nebraska Act, again, is all these states are getting ready to come into the Union, and everybody knows that they're not going to be slave states. So, what the Kansas and Nebraska Act does is repeal the Missouri Compromise. That's the big issue here. Now, we talked about before all these people heading out to California and to the Oregon Territory. And as it turns out, most people that were traveling overland to get to California and Oregon, they were coming from the Ohio River Valley, where, as you can imagine, in the Old Northwest, there is no slavery. That, that was the Northwest Ordinance. So states like Wisconsin, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, there was no slavery there. But a lot of people were heading out of that, country, out of that part of the country and going west to California to the gold fields or in a land rush in Oregon. Well, in going over land, they passed through the Kansas Territory. They can see in that sort of coral color right there in the middle of the sky, in the middle of the map. Now, as it turns out, many of these uh, travelers, many of these, these uh, um, settlers heading west, they would get on the, into the Kansas Territory and they would say, you know what? Um, we're tired. The wagons are down. The oxen or the horses are exhausted. Uh, this part of Kansas, part of Kansas was really actually quite nice, really beautiful. Western Kansas, terrible. But Eastern Kansas is actually quite nice. And so a lot of people from the Ohio River Valley got as far as Kansas and started settling down. And again, another reminder, is a Northwest Ordinance comes into play once again. They reached their 30,000 voters very quickly. This is all about agricultural land. And it's, it's very suitable to grain crops, especially like wheat, oats, and barley. So, But that's not suitable really for slave labor. Again, these guys are not carrying a tradition of slave labor with them. And there are no black people in, in Kansas. So they reach their 60,000 people and start getting ready to come into the Union. And everybody knows that they're going to come in as a free state. Well, the Southerners, especially those people who are there in Missouri, they recognize that this is going to throw the Senate way out of balance. There's just not going to be any more slave states coming in. And now two more slave, uh, free states come in. And so uh, the South will lose control of the House of Representatives, and they will ir irretrievably lose control of the Senate. And that only leaves the presidency. And the South felt like they were losing power in a big way and never regained that. However, the states get ready to come in, and so the Missouri Compromise is revealed, uh, is repealed. But that is replaced by the idea of popular sovereignty. You can see it there in bullet point. I have it bold and uh, capitalized. And so let's, let's figure out a definition for popular sovereignty. Popular sovereignty is the concept that the people of a territory can decide for themselves if they're going to enter the Union as a new state and be either a free state or a slave state. Popular sovereignty is the concept that the people of a territory that's getting ready to enter the Union as a new state can decide for themselves if they're going to enter the Union as a free state or as a slave state. So the Missouri Compromise is over with, and popular serenity with the Kansas-Nebraska Act is put in its place. Now, the Kansas-Nebraska Act has all sorts of other things going on with it. I'm not interested in that. I'm only interested in this whole popular sovereignty issue. Okay? So popular sovereignty means that the people of Kansas are now uh, in a situation where they have to decide if they're going to come in as free or slave. And the people of Missouri feel that they can influence that. They feel that they can influence that population. So, the Kansas-Nebraska Act will lead directly to um, an issue called Bleeding Kansas. And this is where the violence begins. Bleeding Kansas leads directly to that. So, as we talk about uh, Bleeding Kansas, just remember what our thesis statement is. What is the South willing and able to do to preserve slavery? So, we're seeing the stage here for really the beginning of the shooting of the Civil War. Alright, so let's move on to the next slide and talk about Bleeding Kansas. 
Now, at issue here is um, popular sovereignty, and Kansas has reached or is very close to reaching 80,000 voters, white male landowners. Lots of people have, have flooded into the Kansas Territory, and they're ready to you know, come into the Union. But because they're above the 3630 line, and there are no African Americans there, and the land, the agriculture there is not really suitable to uh, slave labor, they don't want to come in as a slave state. So the issue of popular sovereignty is established with the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. Well, the people of Missouri then, they feel that they're very strong, very much a slave state, and they feel that they can go across the border and, and basically invade uh, the Kansas Territory and influence the people there to vote for slavery. And this leads immediately to violence. And you can see on the, the kind of explosions there on the map, uh, Lawrence is burned to the ground. Lawrence was the then territorial uh, uh, capital of this territory of, of, of Kansas. Uh, today, obviously, the state capital is in Topeka. But at the time, the territorial capital was in Lawrence. And these border ruffians, and I'll have a, a picture out there in just a minute coming in from Missouri, of uh, these bushwhackers are going to Lawrence, and they, they burned it to the ground. As, at Osawatomie and at Pottawatomie Creek, uh, there are, are more uh, confrontations. There's more fighting. At Pottawatomie Creek, just to kind of foreshadow uh, our, our next issue, which is John Brown of the Crusade, um, John Brown and some of his sons caught up with some of these pro-slavery guys from Missouri and uh, tied them up, basically, and came into a ditch and killed them with axes and swords. So though John Brown emerges as a hero uh, for the abolitionist cause, understand he is a serial axe murderer, okay? Not the friendliest guy that ever was. But the fighting really begins 1856. There's violence all over the place. Some modern historians talk about how um, this violence, this bleeding Kansas event, is really the beginning of the Civil War. I think that's a little bit of a stretch. It was uh, the, these people all live by the feud. It's really hard to, to figure out exactly who is uh, uh, shooting at who, okay, because it's all very chaotic. But um, it is all about violence. We're talking about people shooting at each other with, you know, rifles, shotguns, but also cannons. I mean, there was just really, really a lot of violence going on here in Bleeding Kansas. So again, um, think then of our thesis statement as we go to the next slide and really finish up this Bleeding Kansas business. What is the South ready, willing, and able to do to preserve the institution of slavery? So let's go ahead to the next slide and talk about um, these border ruffians, these free staters, the Lecompton Constitution, and um, finish up Bleeding Kansas for now. Okay, so um, here are just some pictures to kind of reinforce what I was talking about in the, in the previous slide. Uh, on the uh, right-hand side, you can see some of these, these guys that self-identified as border ruffians. Kind of in the uh, lower left there, you can see a guy that self-identified as a stater. These border ruffian guys, they are from Missouri. They're pro-slavery. Uh, they're prepared to use violence to get uh, Kansas to vote for slavery in their uh, territorial constitution. Uh, the free stater, they're all basically from the Ohio River Valley or from the East Coast. They have no tradition of slavery, and they don't want people, you know, basically pushing them around. Well, to make a long story short, some of these border ruffians go to Lawrence, Kansas, and they burned it to the ground. And in the chaos, in, in the, the chaos that follows that, I mean, the people in Lawrence, the then territorial capital, they're, they fled, or they're dead, you know, it's, it's, it's just chaos after that. And these border ruffians, a whole crew of them, will go to Lecompton, which was basically a saloon in the middle of nowhere. And at Lecompton, they get out a sheet of paper. They knew what the Northwest Ordinance said as well. And they write up a, uh, a constitution that's completely bogus. These guys are not from Kansas. They're not going to stay there. They're from Missouri. But they write this constitution up. It's called Lecomp Constitution. And it has a passage in there, an article in the Constitution that says they accept slavery in Kansas. Well, this was then submitted as a genuine territorial constitution. Uh, Kansas had reached their 30,000 voters. They'd got their 60,000 voters. They had to have the Constitution. Okay, so this was submitted. Well, in the South... This, all those senators are saying, yeah, we'll see that the, the, the Kansas wants to come in as a slave state. Her far side, you know, it's kind of, 
this kind of bounce things out. This will be good. This is what we wanted. And the North said, no, no, we know full well that there are black people in Kansas, and the population there is against slavery. They're abolitionists. Well, the, the, of course, the Senate, I mean, it becomes divided over this, and the Southern senators just say, okay, you Northerners, you wanted democracy, you wanted this pop popular sovereignty business, and now the vote went against you, and it's just sour grapes. And the Northern senators, of course, say, no, we actually know what the situation is on the ground in Kansas, and this is completely bogus, this Constitution is. So the fighting in Kansas just continues. And Kansas, even the 60,000 people, will not come into the Union until right at the very, very end of the Civil War. So again, the question is, what, what will the South do to preserve the, the institution of slavery? And they're going to turn a blind eye to the violence out there. They're going to turn a blind eye to what they, they probably strongly suspect is, in fact, a bogus constitution. And, and they're willing to, you know, not lift a finger to stop the violence out there in Kansas. And so, uh, what is the South ready, willing, and able to do to preserve slavery? Well, the answer is anything. You know, they'll go to any lengths to preserve this thing. So that's all I have to say really about the situation out there in Kansas. But I just want you guys to understand that the backdrop of the Civil War, this violence has been going on since 1856. And it is really, really brutal out there in Kansas. And these people live by the feud, and the, the violence will go on until well after the war. But let's transition now and talk about another issue, and it's going to be about John Brown and uh, the crusade, the abolitionist crusade. So let's take a look at what Bron John Brown's up to. Okay, so John Brown, the crusade, again, real quick, a note on your note taking, you see one of these bullet points, you know, kind of write that down, and then listen to what I'm saying, or, you know, uh, write them all down, but leave a gap between them. So John Brown, um, born in 1800, uh, obviously back east, um, pretty sure in Pennsylvania, and um, this was before there was a lot of migration into the Ohio River Valley. But what's important about that, uh, he is a frontiersman. He's been born into this frontier family, and they're perpetually on the move. So in his mid-20s, uh, 1826 or so, uh, he and his family, they move into the Ohio River Valley, knock a bunch of Indians on the head, take their land from them, and he begins a farm. Now, throughout his career, John Brown did a lot of different jobs and had a lot of different um, career pathways, and he was a miserable failure at every one of them. But in Ohio, in particular, I want to draw your attention that he has the farm, uh, he has a wife, um, she uh, basically stays pregnant year in and year out and year in and year out, and she finally died basically from being physically exhausted and being pregnant all the time. Well, that left John Brown with five or six little kids, of which he's going to lose like three or four in, in, in uh, infancy. But then he remarried and has, you know, two or three or four more kids with his second wife until she's basically exhausted as well. So what's important about this, though, is that he's you know going along and he's trying to make a living of it and he's trying to make a go of it. And uh, but he falls into debt and uh, he has to stand by as the farm is auctioned away. You know his cabin's auctioned, all of his possessions are auctioned away to cover all of his debts. And this basically put John Brown um, in a in a sort of a mental state. He he became out of adjustment a little bit. Um, this this really did trip him up. Well, the next bullet point, in 1837, uh, John Brown witnesses uh, a murder of one of his friends and goes to the funeral, and uh, this friend of his was an abolitionist. Uh, by this time, John Brown is out in Kansas, okay? He's moved again, and he's gone out into the Kansas Territory. And he is there at this funeral, and very famously, uh, he stood up in the back of the room, in the back of the uh, uh, um, church there, and had his hand in the Bible and raised his other hand and he said, I swear by all those present and by the Lord God Almighty that I will dedicate the rest of my life to the cause of abolitionism. Okay, so John Brown didn't have many friends and then this guy got murdered and he has to go to this, this funeral and so that, you know, he was a little bit out of adjustment before. He's really out of adjustment now. Well, uh, he rocks along there in Kansas, tries different jobs, tries farming, tries, you know, running a store, different things. He's a failure at all these things. Uh, his sons are getting a little bit older, and they're teens and 20s. Uh, but then in 1857, during this bleeding Kansas event, uh, he is able to corner uh, some of these 
border ruffians, five of these guys, and between him and his sons, they basically tie them up and kick them in a dish and, and murder them with axes. I mean, they don't shoot them. They cut to pieces, just chop them up with axes and swords. It's horrible. So, again, John Brown is a little bit on the screwy side. This guy's not quite all there. He's out of adjustment, way out of adjustment. Well, moving on to the next little point, he concludes that, okay, he's going to be this abolitionist, but there are no black people, there are no slaves in Kansas where he's at. So he concludes that he, what he needs to do is go where the slaves are and actually kind of put his money where his mouth is and get on with the business of, you know, freeing all these slaves, get on to the real business of abolitionism. So he concocts this harebrained scheme to go to Harper's Ferry, Virginia, and there's a very large arsenal there. Now, an arsenal is a weapons factory. They build muskets and pistols uh, for the U.S. Army there. And so his idea, ladies and gentlemen, is to go to Harper's Ferry, Virginia, grab the arsenal through violence, and the surrounding slaves will hear about this and spontaneously rise up, go to Harper's Ferry. He will be there with, you know, musket shot out her, and all these slaves will suddenly be armed, and they will miraculously, you know, turn against all their masters, and evidently one thing will lead to another, and he will lead them across the Ohio River into the Promised Land. Well, kind of a thread here, the setting of all this is kind of the Second Great Awakening, which John Brown had been exposed to his whole life. And uh, if you know the scriptures at all, you know that there is, in fact, a figure in the scriptures who goes to um, a foreign land and then connects with all these slaves and then leads them into the land of milk and honey across the river. And this is Moses. And really, very clearly, um, John Brown saw himself as a sort of a Moses figure and he's going to free these slaves. So, uh, wow, that's kind of what happens next. So this last bullet point will to uh, in the next couple of signs, but he is caught and, and, and he's going to be hanged. And we're going to take a look at this constitutionality. So let's go on, take a look at a couple of images, do some image analysis. Uh, we're starting to get into the age of photography, so that hopefully that's kind of interesting for you guys. And, um, and get, get John Brown, well, get him hanged up. Okay, so uh, this again, this is, uh, this is uh, John Brown and the Crusade. And the crusade here is about the cause of abolitionism. You can see in this photograph that is actually John Brown, a very early kind of daguerreotype, okay, sort of a, an albumen type, a very early sort of photo photograph. And he is sort of reenacting this uh, scene where he's at the funeral and he's raised his hand and he's got his other hand, I know it's a little bit obscured there on the Bible, and he is swearing to abolish slavery. Uh, there's an allegorical image of John Brown kind of up there in that sort of painting in the upper right. And there he is, this larger-than-life figure. Um, I know it's kind of hard to make out, but he's got the Bible in one hand. If you look at it closely, it's got the Alpha and the Omega on it. And in the other hand, he's got a, a, a rifle and kind of slung around his hip on a, on a belt there. He's got a sword and a pistol. And then kind of on the one side is the Union, and on the other side is the Confederacy. And so at his feet, you can kind of make out a dead Confederate soldier and a dead Union soldier. So this is all about an allegory of what John Brown is, you know, bringing. Just hellfire and damnation and retribution, blood in the, in the cause of, you know, washing away the stain of slavery. So uh, when we talk about John Brown and the Crusade, we're talking about a really sort of imperfect understanding of Christianity. Uh, I just don't think that um, you know our Savior would agree with guns and Bibles. Just don't know that, that that's a good idea. You know, I don't think that's really good Christianity. Now, at the bottom of the picture, you can see the trial, but I do want to go into the next slide and go ahead and talk about the trial and uh, some more images of John Brown. So just remember, uh, John Brown kind of sees himself as a um, this this Jesus figure. I'm sorry, this Moses figure. So let's get with it then and finish up John Brown and the Crusade. Now, really quickly, this is just a picture of uh, Harper's Ferry Arsenal. That's what it looked like just before the war. Uh, the, the arsenal would actually change hands 72 times during the Civil War. Okay, it was a key river crossing. 
and the road bridge you can kind of see in the background it'll be all blown up the entire uh, um, all those buildings that you see there in the middle foreground they're going to be all gutted out uh, Harper's Ferry is just going to be wrecked but at the time it was an active federal arsenal they made weapons uh, pistols and muskets especially uh, bayonets and things of that nature for the US Army and so the idea here then is John Brown and several of his followers and some of his sons, a couple of his sons, they go to Arsenal, to Ferry Arsenal. And they, it's a Saturday afternoon, they go in and kind of uh, shoot at the, uh, the security guys. Uh, they grab the powerhouse and get control of that. Uh, the security guy runs off and says to the local sheriff, you know, hey, listen, uh, some guys are down there. They've they're, they got some mild look in their eyes. Uh, a couple of black guys are with them, and they're shooting up the place. And so the sheriff went down there to check out what was going on at the, at the arsenal. Uh, you can imagine that everybody in the town, they all worked for or with the arsenal. So they're all up in arms pretty quickly. But the sheriff down there to check it out. Shots are fired. Comes zipping around his head. Uh, he goes home, changes his pants, and he's down to the, uh, um, the telegraph office and sends a telegraph to the War Department in Washington DC saying listen you know there's there's this incident here I need help to get the arsenal back under control uh, it's in the control of a madman and some people and you know the sheriff didn't know what was going on well at the war department which at that time was under the control of none other than Jefferson Davis uh, there happened to be uh, Jefferson Davis contacted a colonel of cavalry who happened to be at home on leave and this was none other than Robert E. Lee who we will run into later. And Jefferson Davis told Robert E. Lee, listen, I want you to go out there to Harper's Ferry, take a whole bunch of Marines with you from the SMC, the United States Marine Corps, and go out there and set things right. Well, Robert E. Lee, in charge of the Marine Corps, I mean, you know, John Brown ain't got a chance. Plus, he's crazy anyway. This doesn't work. It's a harebrained scheme. So pretty quickly, Robert E. Lee goes out there, uh, grabs, grabs these desperados, uh, ironically, the only one who's killed is one of the freed uh, African slaves that John Brown had with him. And John Brown is then uh, taken back to uh, Richmond, Virginia, and uh, he's basically going to be put on trial. Now, understand that this is a little bit strange. Uh, the Buchanan administration, James Buchanan was president. He should have had first jurisdiction on this. It's clearly a felony. There was clearly a murder. It took place in a federal institution, uh, a federal installation. But um, Buchanan said no. Uh, he was very southern leaning, and he said no, states' rights. Let Virginia have first jurisdiction, and he didn't want the case. So Virginia will put John Brown on trial. Okay. So I think the last slide is the slide, and let's let's go get John Brown finished off. So John Brown is then put on um, put on trial, and you can kind of see from this painting. This is the last painting that was made of John Brown. Famous artist came down uh, from from the north and and, and made the painting. Um, and you can see he's got that whole Moses look going, I guess. And um, you know he goes on trial, but what what's important about the trial itself is that he was put on trial for insurrection, treason, and murder. Okay, insurrection maybe murder possibly uh, he didn't murder anybody it's just one of the other one of his guys got shot but treason now what's important about this ladies and gentlemen is that treason is very specifically defined in the Constitution because the founding fathers didn't want you know people accusing one another of treason uh, that had been something they characterized British politicians for a long time and they didn't want that so in the Constitution, there's a very strict definition of treason, and what John Brown had done had not risen to that level, okay? But Virginia puts him on trial for treason, and boy, sure enough, on the 7th of December, they hanged him right up. And what I really want you guys to out of this, again, a, a reminder of our thesis statement, what is the South ready, willing, and able to do to preserve the institution of slavery? Well, they got their son an abolitionist, and they hanged him. So the message to the North is that the South will act in a completely unconstitutional way to hang or you know, discourage abolitionists from coming down to the South. They, they, they won't put up with it. They won't have it. And to the North, it's a very strong signal that 
you know, uh, the South is ready, willing, and able to do anything. And so the North is becoming more and more concerned that the South is prepared to really just overthrow the Constitution in order to do one thing, and that's have slaves. And as it turns out, that, that's, that's exactly the case. So what the North is really waiting around for is a, a figure to rally around. And we get to Lincoln-Douglas states, that's really what that's all about. But we have a few intermediate steps to get to before we get to Lincoln-Douglas debates, election 1860. So let's move on. And uh, boy, the next one is the craziest story that ever was in American history, in my view. And this is the uh, caning of um, Charles Sumner by Preston Brooks. So John Brown is dead. Uh, hanged up as an abolitionist. Let's move on.
Now, I want to spend a minute here talking about Frederick Douglass. Uh, he was born Frederick Bailey in 1818. Uh, he was born in the South. He was, without fail, he's absolutely a slave. He was born into slavery. And he escapes to the North. He's caught by a slave catcher, savagely beaten, uh, turned back over to his master, uh, and he broke loose and, and escaped again. The second time he escaped, uh, he changed his name to Douglas uh, and, and hides out north. Now, Frederick Douglass was clearly a highly, highly intelligent individual. And he becomes, he's self-taught, he teaches himself literacy, uh, he becomes a publisher, um, he writes extensively uh, in various newspapers, he travels extensively in the north, uh, making speeches. And what's important about Frederick Douglass, and please make a strong note on this, Frederick Douglass puts a face on slavery. He talks extensively in the North to anybody who will listen, you know, uh, all these big abolitionist crowds, and he addresses them, and he talks about his life as a slave. Now, what I, one of, what I want you guys to really get at here is that most people in the North had never seen a black man before in their lives. And so by putting a face on slavery, he's really doing uh, a, a, a tremendous service to the abolitionist cause. Because nobody had seen a black man in the North. So this, it was all, the, uh, abolitionism was very abstract. You know, many people by 1854 had read uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin, and they, they felt like they knew what the horrors were, but they still didn't have any connection with a person of color. Now, when Douglas would go to these speeches, uh, he made certain that after the speech was over, he would have a big recession. And he would mingle with the crowd, talk to people as individuals. And this was to counter, counteract these rumors that the South was spreading, that he was being followed around by a white man, a sort of a puppeteer, whispering in ear what to say, how to act. And to be clear, what I'm coming at here is that, you know, comportment, or how you deal with other people in a conversation, you just can't hide being illiterate or of low intelligence or not really understanding where you're at or what's going on. You just can't hide that in ordinary conversation. Frederick Douglass knew that. So he made a point to go around and talk to people extensively in a reception after every speech. That way he would make sure that people understood that his intelligence was, was within him. It was his own. He was genuinely uh, who he purported to be, a highly intelligent, he was a man, he was, he was a highly intelligent individual. Now, uh, Frederick Douglass will agitate and uh, be active in the abolition movement until uh, his death. He will continue to agitate and never, never give up until uh, nearly into the 20th century. Uh, very famously, a young man in the 1880s approached Frederick Douglass and said, listen, you know, uh, here it is in the 1880s, uh, I'm African American, uh, what should I do with my life? How should I, you know, uh, how should I do the things that you've done, achieve the things that you've achieved? And Frederick Douglass had the best answer, and this is what I say to everybody. How do you live your life? What do you need to achieve? Agitate, agitate, agitate. Never give up. Keep struggling. Find a cause and go for it. Never, never stop. So he's really a, a tremendous cheerleader, a, a really uh, a, an amazing leader of the abolitionist cause and of the African-American cause, especially in the post-Civil War era. So Frederick Douglass, the big thing here, he wants to put a face on what slavery was really all about. In other words, these people were human beings. This idea uh, that permeated the South and that was told to people in the North that Africans were of a lower species, that they were of a lower level of intelligence. All this racist crap that the South was saying, you know, uh, Fred Douglas, by talking to people in the North, he destroyed that notion. Okay, so I can't say enough good about Frederick Douglass. Um, side note, for those of you who ever have to, like, write a paper, an English paper, you need to do a bio or something like that, Frederick Douglass is your man. He is amazing. His speeches are tremendous. I mean, they are genuine America. I wish I could write as good as Frederick Douglass wrote, you know, 150 years ago. He's just an amazing American. 
Let's go on then and talk next about the Dr. Scott case. Now, this will be the only Supreme Court case that we talk about um, uh, during this part of uh, during this last section of uh, 1401. So let's take a look at the Dred Scott case and um, see what that has to do with the outcome of, uh, with the beginning of the uh, Civil War. Okay, the Dred Scott case, and this is a Supreme Court case, and I have, I think, uh, uh, several slides leading, uh, uh, surrounding this, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, some political cartoons, uh, and then the uh, um, outcome, and then the outbreak of the Civil War. But we need to talk about the Dred Scott case, and again, your outline on any Supreme Court case is a little bit of background. Then we will talk about the plaintiff side and then the defendant side. Then we need to uh, uh, advance to the next slide and talk about uh, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Roger B. Taney. And then we'll talk about the outcome of the case and then what it has to do with American history. And the Dred Scott case, uh, it's, it's really an amazing case. So, the background. Dred Scott was uh, exactly what we would anticipate, and we've talked about this before, as a slave. He is a body servant a butler. He works for a surgeon, John Emerson. Now John Emerson was an army surgeon and so he traveled extensively and Dred Scott was basically his uh, a surgeon, his butler. Uh, when you know the doctor had to load up, he would pack all the clothes, bring the horse around, drive the buggy, uh, you know, carry, carry the doctor's bags, things of that nature. Um, and John Emerson, this, this surgeon, traveled extensively so he was assigned by the army to the Wisconsin Territory and he took Dred Scott with him and so there was Dred Scott and Dr. Uh, Emerson up there in the Wisconsin Territory and they stayed up there for years now some sources differ on this but the best source that I can uh, come up with indicate that at that point Dred Scott is going to get married to his wife Harriet who you see there as well and then right about now she's a slave at the time but immediately after that, Wisconsin comes into the Union as a free state. Now, um, Dred Scott had gone to the trouble of making sure that he had a public service for his wedding, uh, and he made sure that the wedding was registered in the then territory of Wisconsin. But then he was in Wisconsin when Wisconsin came in as a free state. Well, at about that age, John Emerson died. Now, his wife comes into the play at that point and his wife is the plaintiff so John Brown sorry, uh, Scott is the defendant and wife is the plaintiff and she is from Missouri and to her Missouri is a slave state to her she wants her property back now to her the case is very straightforward she feels that Dred Scott and therefore his wife Harriet why they're just like a piece of baggage or like a wagon they're like a horse they're like any other property that had belonged to the doctor and she wanted that property so she could settle up the estate Dred Scott's side was that he was had lived in the north for a long period of time he was in Wisconsin when Wisconsin came into the Union as a free state and at that point he should have been freed Again, sources vary on this, but uh, he makes the case that he was married in the North, and that marriage is recorded in the public office in the North and recognized in the North. So both he and his wife should be free people. And he refused to go back to Missouri. He won't do it. Well, the case then um, emerges as Dreadnought versus Sanford. Don't get confused by this. Sanford is simply the lawyer that takes the case on behalf of John Emerson's widow. So it's Dred Scott v. Sanford, but Sanford is the lawyer who takes the case on behalf of John Emerson's widow. It happened to be her son-in-law. Okay, so Dred Scott v. Sanford. Now, at issue are the African Americans' citizens. And so that's what it goes up through the regular. Now, please make a strong note on this. The case goes up through the regular appellate system. In other words, one side or the other, no matter what the outcome of the case is, at the lower court level, one side or the other will demur. D-M-U-R-R. -R. One side or the other will demur. They will disagree with the outcome of the case. So if the case went against Dred Scott, Sanford would demur and appeal to the next court. If the case went against Dred Scott, uh, he would demur and he would get to the next level to the next court. So this case did work its way up through the normal appellate court system. 
but it arrives at the Supreme Court, and this is where things take a very strange turn. So is Dred Scott a piece of property like any other piece of property? That is Sanford's side. Or is Dred Scott a free African citizen and therefore a citizen with all the rights of any other citizen? That's Dred Scott's side. Okay, but let's go on to the next slide and, and take a little bit more, take a look at the actual outcome of the, of, of the Supreme Court case. And this will lead us to an interesting character named Roger B. Taney. Okay, now the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court at the time was Roger B. Taney. Now I say it Taney because somebody actually asked him how he pronounced his last name and he kind of phonetically spelled it out. So it's Roger B. Taney. Now Roger B. Taney had been an officer in a wide variety of offices his whole political career. Uh, he was from a northern state, really, uh, Maryland, and he was a northern Democrat. So in this case he's very, very um, uh, conservative and he's pro-slavery. So again, he had office after office after office as a Democrat in various offices, but then uh, Buchanan appoints him to the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Now, he takes over the Supreme Court, and he's a close personal friend of James Buchanan, and then the Dred Scott case lands on his desk. And the first thing that's really strange about this, okay, Roger B. Taney, again, he's a very conservative guy from a safe state, Maryland. And so he's probably pro-slavery anyway. But at this stage, J. Buchanan, again a close personal friend of Robbie Taney, uh, pulls him aside basically to have a little meeting. And uh, Buchanan says, listen, you allow Dred Scott to go free, and you agree that he's a free citizen of the United States, then we're going to have to fight the Civil War right now. So Buchanan influenced Taney's decision. And as you know, that is very, very unconstitutional. That's very, very improper. That is a, um, a separation of powers issue. And so you can't do that. The president cannot influence the Supreme Court. But Taney was probably going to go for the Sanford side anyway, uh, because, again, he's from a slave state. Now, he gets the judgment. In other words, he gets the case, and then he makes his judgment. And I want to be clear on this, too. When he makes his judgment, he does not go with what the Constitution indicates. He disregards the Constitution and his um, his approach to this is this very tortured logic about how uh, Africans were brought against their will to America and uh, it's just this crazy that has nothing whatever to do with the Constitution. I want us to make a strong note on that. Roger B. Tunney's uh, opinion on the Dred Scott case had nothing to do with the Constitution. It was very twisted, very turned logic. And Roger B. Taney oversteps the boundaries of the case. Roger B. Taney oversteps the boundaries of the case. What Roger B. Taney concludes is that he should never have seen the case in the first place. But no African person, no person of African descent could ever be a citizen, nor ever was a citizen of the United States of America. So a stroke of a pen, Roger B. Tunney stripped the citizenship of all of the free blacks that had been living in the North, many of them since before the Revolution. He stripped the citizenship of all the black people who had been living in New York, for instance, who had end slavery and manumitted all their slaves all at once in the 1790s. Suddenly they were all slaves again, and they could not be a citizen of the United States. They couldn't sue. They had no legal rights at all. No person of African descent anywhere in America had any civil rights at all. None. No rights as a citizen. And so the North, again, is completely outraged by this. And the South, of course, is absolutely thrilled. So to make a long story short, Dred Scott lost his case. Now, his feat is really kind of unknown. Uh, lawyers and abolitionists get control of Dred Scott and make sure that he actually never goes back to Missouri. And so uh, the widow Emerson did never, never got him back as any kind of property. Again, some sources vary on this, but the best sources seem to indicate that Dred Scott lived in the North with his wife Harriet uh, until he died just a few years later, uh, really before the end of the Civil War. But the important thing about the Dred Scott case is that the Supreme Court is, has exhibited corruption in 
the effort to preserve slavery. Roger B. Taney allowed himself to be influenced by the Cannon administration. Uh, he overstepped the boundaries of the case and stripped citizenship from all of these people in the North who had been citizens and granted citizenship uh, for, you know, many of them for over a century. And this oversteps the boundaries of the case. It's not up to the Supreme Court to uh, grant or strip citizenship in this way. Citizenship is guaranteed in the first in, in Article of the Constitution. If you're born in America, you're automatically a citizen of the United States. That part of the Constitution does not make a differentiation between African American blood or Indian blood for that matter, or uh, Chinese or Irish or anybody else. If you're born in the United States, you're a citizen of the United States. And so Roger B. Taney, uh, through this really tortured logic, had over had basically overturned the first of the first Article One of the Constitution. And so, what I really want you guys to get out of this going forward, in other words, more than the case itself, what's important about this is that the Supreme Court can make mistakes. And the Dred Scott case, everybody agrees with this, is the worst Supreme Court case judgment uh, opinion in American history. The one right, right below that is Plessy v. Ferguson. And then, really, the Citizens United case, uh, just a few years ago, is probably number three. I mean, the worst case in American legal history is the Scott case. After that is Plessy v. Ferguson, and we will talk about that in uh, the 1302 part. And then, um, most legal historians today agree that uh, the Citizens United case, which opens the door to corruption in our elective system, um, that's probably uh, that's that's a very bad judgment on the part of the Supreme Court. Uh, they in, in the Citizens United case, they did not go with the Constitution really. They overstepped the boundaries case. And so, this is really uh, that's a big legacy of the Dred Scott case, and it will lead directly or indirectly, depending on how you count your beans, uh, straight to the Civil War. The North is outraged. So again, our thesis statement: What is the North? Uh, what is the South ready, willing, and able to do to preserve the institution of slavery? Uh, turn a blind eye to the corruption of the Supreme Court. This judgment is terrible. It's just, it's just awful. And um, you know, not a bad things can be said about it. But let's move on then past this uh, court case, and we're going to talk about uh, a little bit about politics, and then we're going to uh, have another lead-in slide for you, and we'll talk about the Lincoln Douglas debates. We'll have a we'll take a look at a few political cartoons, and then the election of 1860. Now this is a sort of a complex slide, and I want to try and simplify it and get through it as quickly as possible, uh, because this uh, you know po party politics can be kind of boring. Now, what I really want you guys to get out of this, is in the time frame we're talking about, really uh, 1856 to 1860, there were three major parties. Uh, there was the Democrat, Democratic Party, and that was kind of split between Northern Democrats and Southern Democrats, the difference basically being uh, the issue of slavery. So the Democrat Party had, and it's just the nature of the conservative party, uh, they're very, very disciplined. Uh, the, it's a very strong party organization. Uh, they're they're all about causes. Uh, they're all about strong personalities. John C. Calhoun is a good example of that. Uh, very powerful personalities. And so, over the years, the Democratic Party had been very strong. Uh, most of the nation was really what you might call center right. We're going into the Civil War era, the late antebellum period. And so, you can even see California out there is you know pretty much. Uh, uh, a democratic controlled state. But the flip side of that is what is going on on the other side politically. As you can imagine, really what's happening is most of the nation is kind of center center. But the problem is that the progressive party cannot hold itself together. And that's the equivalent of the Democratic Party today, the Liberal Party today. They try to embrace every cause that's out there. Therefore, they can embrace nothing. Uh, strong leader, yeah, right. Uh, you no, know, not that's not that doesn't happen very often in the liberal party. Uh, you have the very far left, the kind of middle left, uh, the center left, and they just can't hold themselves together. So for a while, uh, they'd been the anti-federalists. When then that party went away and just became extinct, then they reemerged in the 1830s as. Uh, uh, the Whig Party, and then that party basically imploded. 
And so as we're going into the mid-1850s, a new party begins to emerge, and it is the Republican Party. But it is leaderless. It's kind of a weak. Uh, they don't have much of a ground game going on, and they just don't have a whole lot of appeal to most of the population because it's a fairly new party, and it's not a proven performer. Whereas the Democrats, you know, they're kind of center right, and so a lot of people can kind of get along with the Democrats. Well, and in the South, obviously, and that's kind of that way today, uh, that's, it's just very, very, very conservative in the South, and so they always appeal to the conservative party. So... Uh, James Buchanan is the president. He gets elected in 1856. He's kind of a northern Democrat, but he's very sympathetic towards the South. Uh, but he's very, very weak as a president. He's just kind of a compromised figure, a sort of offholder. Even he knew, James Buchanan knew, that he was going to be in for one term, and then he was out. He said so publicly at the time. Uh, he was older by that time. He couldn't make a decision. Uh, it's just, you know, he's just catastrophic as a, as a president. So... What's important about this slide, though, what I really want you guys to get out of this, is if the Republican Party can ever pull themselves together and exhibit some really strong leadership, uh, they're going to beat the Democrats because the Democrats are overreaching on the issue of slavery. Uh, they're becoming, especially in the South, they're becoming very, very, uh, uh, they're ready, willing, and able to do anything to preserve the issue of slavery. And so things like uh, bleeding Kansas, things like the the uh, Dred Scott case, things like the caning of Charles Sumner, these things really animating the North, and it's really scaring the North about the Democratic Party, what the Democratic Party is becoming. So if the Republicans can never pull themselves together, uh, that will emerge as a very strong counterforce against the Democrats. Okay, so that's all I really want you guys to get out of the slot. But let's lead on to, uh, I think I have a lead-in slide, I'm sorry, an outline slide next, and then talk about the Lincoln-Douglas debates. Okay, we're getting really close to the American Civil War. We're going to talk about the Lincoln-Douglas debates, talk about the election of 1860, which is the last election, obviously, that's going to bring Lincoln into power, and that'll be the election that really kicks off the war. We'll take a look at the Southern Reaction. I'll talk a little bit about Lincoln's inaugural address. Then we'll get the shooting started at Fort Sumter. After this whole class is where I really wanted to get to, the Civil War. And we'll get that started at Fort Sumter. We'll talk a little bit about opposed plans. Um, the North actually has a meaningful plan. It's called the Annika Plan. Where the South, it's more about a principle. It's just more about a concept. And it's really a stand on the defense. But we will talk about that. Then we'll move on. We'll take a look at some of the, uh, the people that are actually... Uh, uh, engaged in this terrible, terrible conflict. If you recall, when we talked about the American War of Independence, I gave you some figures that were kind of a metaphor for the common soldier, of Plum Martin. We talked about some of the guys that were actually batting out in the field, um, George Rogers Clark and some of these other guys, and uh, I'll, I'll be doing it again for the Civil War. And then we'll get to the first kind of battle which sets the stage for all battles that follow, and that's the first battle of Bull Run. But, and we have to get Lincoln uh, elected, and that leads us to the Lincoln-Douglas debates. The setting of the Lincoln-Douglas debates is the by-election in Illinois of 1858. The by-election of 1858. The presidential election had been in 1886. The next one will be a few years later in 1860. So this is the by-election 1858, and it's for the Senate seat for Illinois. Now, uh, the senator then, the incumbent senator, was Steve Douglas, and we've run into him before. He's a northern Democrat, he's a conservative, but as a northerner, he cannot support slavery. He can't. Challenger is this uh, new lawyer from uh, uh, Illinois, from southern Illinois, from Springfield, as it turns out, uh, named Abram Lincoln. And he is associated with this fairly new party, emerging party, the Republicans. And so uh, he's kind of an unknown force, but he is going to challenge uh, Stephen Douglas for the Senate seat of Illinois in the by-election 1858. And there are seven joint debates where they get up there like they do today on television. Uh, obviously, they didn't have television back in those days. They get up there in front of a big crowd, and they, they talk. And the moderator gives them a series of questions, and they answer these things, and there's kind of Q&A going on. What's important about that, again, and I've talked about this, this is not really for the crowd. 
they have to talk to the crowd and they have to respond to the crowd. But it's not really their target market is not the crowd. Their target market is newspaper reporters that are all over the place writing down basically everything I say. They write down the questions, they write down the, the responses. Now, in terms of the issues, we really don't have time to get into that. Uh, because I want to get on to the fighting, I want to get on to the Civil War, and the whole idea under any circumstance is to get Lincoln into the White House. But the idea here is that they talked about every all the major problems that faced the Republic. Uh, taxation, for instance, uh, Western lands, okay, Western migration, this continual upheaval. They talked about the Dred Scott case, which was then ending. Uh, talked about basically everything that was gone. But on the issue of slavery, now I want to be clear on this, both sides had to dance around that issue. Lincoln could not really emerge as fiery abolitionist. He was not in the first place, and he was too careful of a politician to really embrace that. To be clear, there's a lot of people in Illinois that just that, that issue did not mean anything to them. Most of them had seen a black man in their life. The people that had seen black men or were exposed to African Americans really didn't care for them that well. Saw them as sort of uh, a competition in the labor market. And so uh, Lincoln understands that. So he can't really come out as a free abolitionist. But he can strongly suggest that he wants to limit slavery to where it is at at that point. In other words, not allow slavery to be expanded. And of course, it's going to fly right in the face of the Dred Scott case when that was uh, when that was adjudicated. On Frederick Douglass' side, I'm sorry, Stephen Douglass' side. On Stephen Douglass' side, uh, he's referred to as the little giant. He was not a very large man, uh, sort of portly. You can see him there, but he had a big booming voice and uh, uh, really a, a sharp intellectual mind. And he was the incumbent in this race. But on the issue of slavery, he too had to dance around that. Okay, he's a northern Democrat, so he's a conservative. But from the state of Illinois, he too cannot really advocate slavery really strongly. He can't come and say, yeah, I want all black men to be slaves. Because he knows that the electorate will not stand for that sort of thing. So that signals to the South that he's not really a strong proponent of slavery. And that's what they really wanted. So both sides really have to dance around the issue of slavery. Now, one last thing that I really want to talk about, and I want you guys to take a good, strong note on this, and this is the way both of these guys approached the debate questions. At stake is Senate seat for Illinois, but everybody in the nation understood that this was really setting the stage for the next guy who was going to be up there uh, running for president. Now, again, they're speaking to these newspaper guys. And when Frederick Douglass, I'm sorry, Stephen Douglass, I don't know why I keep calling him Frederick, when Stephen Douglass would respond to the questions, he would go about this in a very uh, learned, erudite, very educated way. And he would talk about process in the Senate. And he would talk about how, you know, how the filibuster worked, how, you know, uh, committees worked, and how he would, like, shepherd all these bills and all these issues through the Senate. He would talk about the things done in the past. He was the incumbent. But if you can imagine, in a newspaper, that is very, very dry. By contrast, and this is important, Lincoln, when he was faced question, he always had a story. He always had a homily. He always had some interesting thing to say about it. Uh, if you guys watch that, uh, there's a movie that's recently out called uh, Lincoln. And this is really uh, 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 on full display in that movie. Uh, Lincoln always had these really great stories, these homilies that made his point through storytelling. Now again, what's important about that is how does that read in the newspapers? It reads really great. He had a great grasp on the issues of the day, and he had an excellent way of conveying his thoughts to the greater public. He could appeal to common man. So moving forward, Stephen Douglas will win re-election. He will be the senator from Illinois, elected in 1858. Lincoln will lose the election. However, because all of his homilies, all of his stories, all of his ways of addressing the issues that uh, affect the nation at the time, these receive really wide publication. So what's important about this, Lincoln emerges as leader 
of the Republican Party. Everybody in the Republican Party see him as a genuine, as the guy they've been looking for this whole time. To unify the party, uh, to bring in the big tent, uh, to talk to the common man, um, to galvanize the North against the excesses of the South. So Lincoln-Douglas debates. Why did we talk about this? This catapults Lincoln to the very top of the Republican ticket for the 1860 election. Now let's take a look at that in terms of some political cartoons, the next two slides. And what I always want you guys to get out of these illustrations is people understood what was going on at the time. The Lincoln-Douglas debates, uh, Douglas, Stephen Douglas will go back to the Senate for Illinois, but Lincoln becomes a nationally recognized figure for the Republican Party. Now again, this cartoon is fairly straightforward, but I want you guys to look at the details in this because this is what everybody would do. Obviously, it's Lincoln versus Little Giant, and you can see uh, Lincoln, this tall, lanky figure, uh, before he had his you know, famous beard. Uh, you don't really see him in a top hat back in these days. Uh, but there he is in his corner, and of course, in his corner, as his, you know, as his, uh, uh, as his team there, is Dred Scott. And so Lincoln, although he never did advocate abolitionism, everybody understood that the Republicans generally were abolitionists. So Dred Scott is associated, even in his early days, with Lincoln. Okay, that is to say the African American movement, the African American abolitionist movement was associated with the Republican Party of which Lincoln was the head. Now on the other side you see there again Stephen Douglas and in his corner, okay, Douglas was of Irish descent. So in his corner you see a drunken Irishman. And uh, I know it's kind of hard to see in this slide, but you'll take a careful look. Uh, there's a whiskey bottle in the hand of that drunken Irishman. And that was supposed to be the poor working whites. And they were supposed to be on the side of uh, Stephen Douglas. He was supposed to be, had the big appeal for, uh, evidently, drunken Irishmen. But really, the working poor, that was really his target market in the North. But in the background, obviously, you can see all the politicians and everybody understands that this, uh, this fight is really for the White House. Either Douglas or Lincoln is going to run for, the, for election in 1860, uh, and uh, sure enough, both of them will, and, and at stake here is the executive mansion. So let's move on and take another look at a, a, another political cartoon uh, from the era that really does illustrate what's going on politically. Now this is the political quadrille. A quadrille is a sort of a dance. As you can see, there are four, ta uh, there are four uh, teams of dancers uh, with uh, the guy uh, playing the music there in the middle. And you'd have somebody, you know, calling the tune. Well, in this particular case, the person calling the tune is Dred Scott. There he is. Uh, very much in this sort of race uh, depiction. But there he is, and Dred Scott is, is he's calling the tune. Uh, you can make out Lincoln uh, uh, in the uh, upper right. And this, uh, in case you didn't realize this, this is a very risque photograph. Um, Lincoln was happily married to his wife, Mary Todd, and she was from a very, very respectable Illinois family. Uh, her father was a judge, and the judge didn't really approve of Lincoln, and so she was from a very, very upper middle class family, very, very uh, respectable. But here's Lincoln dancing with Harry Scott, that is to say, Dred Scott's wife. And not only is Lincoln dancing with a black woman, he's dancing with another guy's wife, and she's showing a little bit of ankle, ladies and gentlemen. This is very, very gay. Oh my gosh. In the lower right, you can see um, Ben Harrison, I'm sorry, William Henry Harrison. He was still kicking around as a politician in those days. And um, he uh, established a reputation as an Indian fighter, and so there he is, along with the native, this Native American, uh, who presumably he's going to kill later on. Uh, in the lower left, you can see um, Stephen Douglas, and again, he's dancing with this drunken uh, Irishman, uh, the working whore, dressed in rags there. Again, I know it's hard to make out, but in his pocket of this, uh, this figure there, uh, there's a bottle in his back pocket there, and that's who uh, Stephen Douglas is supposed to be a P2. Uh, really, really strange character uh, up there in the um, uh, upper left. Uh, this, this character uh, as the goat, that is the president, as it turns out. Uh, his nickname was Buck, as in Buck Buchanan. And there he is. And then John Bell, another very famous uh, Southern Democrat, is there with him. And so these uh, Southern and the Northern Democrat, uh, the president states in this really, uh, 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 you know, kind of 
a negative uh, depiction of him as, as this bully goat. Uh, there they are. They're dancing together. So the whole idea is that Dred Scott, the Dred Scott case, is just animating all of politics, and Dred Scott is really calling the tunes. But once again, what I really want to get out of this is that Lincoln, he's not really a fiery abolitionist. He just is not. That is not his political cause. Uh, he disagreed with slavery and had, had very strong personal feelings against it, but he didn't feel like uh, you know that that was a, a a legal case for the presidency. And so, uh, but he here he is being depicted in a cartoon that was very very widespread. It's in your textbook, as it turns out, and uh, he's depicted associated with the African American cause, with with the abolition cause. Let's on to the election of 1860, and let's get linked into office. Uh, this could be a very uh, uh, short and sweet uh, sl slide uh, next, and we're going to get Lincoln uh, in, and then we'll get him inaugurated, and then we'll kick off the war. Okay, so what we're looking at here is another uh, political map, and this is the election of 1860. Now, as I've pointed out, South has overreached again and again and again, and the North found this to be very, very alarming. That is to say, the broader population in the North found this to be very, very alarming. Uh, the South was ready, willing and able to uh, um, uh, exhibit the Fugitive Slave Act, which was clearly unconstitutional. Uh, the South was ready to turn a blind eye to the violence going on out in Kansas. The South was ready to overlook uh, um, the violence in the Senate. The South was going to hang up John Brown, uh, this abolitionist, as a signal uh, to, the, to the North that you know, abolitionism would not be tolerated. Uh, they were ready to, uh, you know, over, uh, to uh, overlook uh, the court in the Supreme Court, and so this was very alarming to the people of the North. So the Republican Party really does get control of the North as a result of this Southern overreach. Now, on the South side, they were very, very paranoid about their political chances. They never had control of the House of Representatives. Because of the entry of California, and later on Oregon, and the, the precipitous uh, arrival of Kansas, they were going to be next, and that was clearly going to be a free state. I also recognized that they had no control over the Senate. So the only place where the South had any kind of meaningful political control was in the presidency. And they were ready, willing, and able to do anything to preserve the, uh, 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 the institution of slavery. And so they were fighting bitterly hard to make sure that the only person that got elected was going to be very, very rapidly pro-slavery. Well, that obviously made that person unsuitable to the broader electorate. Now, Stephen Douglas will run for the North, and he will be badly defeated. You can see in the Northern Democrats, uh, they just didn't carry anything. Uh, the Constitutional Union, which was John Bell, uh, they didn't win uh, very much either. I don't think they won a single state. The Southern Democrats with Breckinridge, you can see them there in the green, okay? And um, that is the South. But And, and sure enough, um, Breckinridge was very rapidly uh, pro-slavery. And he, was, he would not tolerate anything that had to do with anything that wasn't going to be uh, pro-slavery. But the Republican Party with Lincoln carried all those northern states and California. Well, if you carry New York, you look at the Electoral College. If you carry New York and Pennsylvania, you basically don't have to carry anything else in the South. The South had no population to speak of, even with the three-fifths rule. Just didn't carry enough votes in the Electoral College. If you carry New York and Pennsylvania, and maybe one of the other western states, then you don't have to carry any other state. Whereas the South, if you're going to be president from the South, you had to carry every state in basically in the Union if you didn't have uh, New York or Pennsylvania. So uh, the South, their party has divided. To be clear, Douglas is a Democrat, Bell is a Democrat, and Breckinridge is a Democrat. The Democratic Party, the Conservative Party, is split three ways. So no way can they ever, ever, ever win in the Electoral College. Whereas the Republicans under Lincoln are unified, and they carry the northern states. So Lincoln will win in the Electoral College. However, I want you guys to take a really strong note on this. Lincoln will lose in the general election. He will lose badly in the, in the, in the popular vote. Lincoln only carries 40% of the vote. That is to say, 60% of the population voted against him. Now. Don't put too much stock in that. Lincoln was not even on the ballot in any of these southern states. 
Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama, and I think Georgia didn't allow Lincoln's name to be on the ballot. So if you wanted to vote for him, first you had to know who he was, then you had to write it in, and then that vote had that counted and not, you know, be corruptly thrown out. But under any circumstances, Lincoln only carried 40% of the popular vote. 60% of the population voted conservative. The Republican Party was still un unfamiliar to most people. But in the Electoral College, the Republicans, Lincoln will crush the other three, the, the divided Democratic Party. So it's 58% of the Electoral College, and that's, that's a clear win, an unambiguous win. And that's mainly because he's going to carry New York, Pennsylvania. Uh, he carried his home state of noise. Okay? So Lincoln lost the vote, but won in the Electoral College. Now again, think of the political situation in the macro. The South, the pro-slave South, this has no control of the House of Representatives. They have no control in the Senate, and they have no control of the presidency. They have lost presidency. So the South extremely paranoid about hanging on slavery. They feel they have to leave the Union. They have no representation. They have no authority in government. Now this is a really unfortunate and very cynical way of looking at how our government works. But uh, the South felt like they had no power anymore and so they felt like they had to leave the Union. Okay, so the 1860. Let's take a look at uh, Lincoln inauguration. Uh, I, it's just a, a photograph, and I just want to go over that really fast and then get on to his inaugural address. So the election was in November 1860, and as you can see, his inaugural was in March 4, 1861. So again, we were talking about long, lame duck period between the election in November 1860 and then um, Lincoln does his inauguration in 1861. And in the next couple of maps, uh, the next time we see a map, we're going to see that a lot of states are actually going to leave the Union under Buchanan. So that's not really a Lincoln's fault, but we'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, this is the um, inauguration, and you can see kind of that, that pavilion on the steps of the Capitol building there. Uh, in the background, what I really want you to take note of is the Capitol building is still under construction, and it will remain under construction during the entire uh, Civil War. A lot of people don't know this, but the dome is not made of ivory. I'm sorry, uh, ivory. It's not made of marble. It's made of iron that is painted white. And so if you can imagine this gigantic dome and all the iron that goes into it, and then all the iron reinforcement that has to like go into building to like support it, uh, this is a tremendous amount of effort that is going into this huge structure during the height of the Civil War. Lincoln insisted that the building go on. So there he is on uh, the Capitol building, which, by the way, side note on it had been under construction since the War of 1812. Okay, so here we are in 1860, and it's been under construction this whole time. But um, he makes the speech. Uh, Lincoln uh, was afraid of being assassinated on his way to Washington, D.C., and his security team um, um, convinced him to come into Washington, D.C. at night with no fanfare and kind of uh, be a, a sort of disguised. And Lincoln, uh, he went along with that, but then later on he very much regretted that. Uh, he should have, you know, just gone out there and been bold and been brave and put a really uh, a brave face on arriving in Washington, D.C. But he did not do that. Uh, he appears there uh, in his inauguration speech, and that's really what I want to take a look at, which is the uh, next slide. So let's move on and talk about the inaugural address. Now, what we have here is uh, some excerpts of Lincoln's inaugural address. No need to write this down, but uh, if you guys want to see or read an amazing piece of American political literature, and I say that uh, uh, plainly, it is literature. It's an amazing piece of American uh, literature. Read Lincoln's inaugural address. It is just an amazing document. So I urge you, any time, you've got a few free minutes on your hands, or you need to do a bit of research for another paper, say for the English department or something like that, uh, Lincoln's inaugural address is just an amazing document. And to next to Jesus of that, uh, you're, just, you're just a guarantee on that. But what I have here is a few excerpts, and I want to try and give you guys a feeling of how Lincoln uh, approached these big problems. Now, the election was in number. And he is uh, doing this in, uh, in March 1861. So he's speaking 
and the message is really delivered, it's really directed at the South. Some of these southern states, the lower tier of southern states, we'll get to that in a few minutes, have already left the Union. And he's directing the inaugural address at them. So the first thing he says is, now you guys got to pay attention to this. I have no purpose, directly or indirectly, to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. Now that is a clear and unambiguous statement. He is not an abolitionist. What Lincoln wants to do is preserve the Union. In your notes, please write that down and underline it. Lincoln's cause is to preserve the Union. So he will take slavery, will take the Union with slavery, or he will take the Union without slavery. But he's saying to the South, let's solve this together. And so here we go. Plainly the section is the essence of anarchy. Physically speaking, we cannot separate. Man and woman may divorce, but the different parts of the country may not do this. Okay, well, let's take a look at that for a minute. Now, again, here is Lincoln using a homily, using a language that normal people would be able to understand. Divorce was very much frowned upon back in those days. Uh, this is the middle of the Victorian era. And people just did not divorce. But what is he saying here? A man and a woman can divorce. And then, you know, what happens? You know, you come home from work, and uh, all your stuff is out there on the front lawn, and the locks have been changed on the house, and you know you got a divorce on your hand. Okay? So you load up all your stuff in your vehicle, and you go. But the nation is physically connected. The land cannot pick up and move. In other words, the south is where it is geographically, and the north is where it is geographically. What Lincoln is driving at here... He can foresee that there is a separation. Please make a strong note on this. Lincoln can foresee that if there is separation, if there is a Southern Confederacy, as time goes on, the North will find something in the South that they want and attack. The South will find something that the North has or has done and they will attack. And then they will fight to exhaustion There'll be a peace tree of some sort. They'll gather allies. They'll put their finances back into order. And then there'll be another war. And they'll fight to exhaustion. There'll be a peace treaty. They'll get their finances back in order. Uh, they'll gather allies. And you've seen this pattern before. Lincoln was a student of history. And he knew. He knew what this was going to happen. He knew what was going to happen if there was actually a separation. So he says the different parts of the country may not do this. We are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Mystic chords of memory will yet swell as the course of the Union, when again touched, as surely they will be, by the better angels of our nature. The better angels of our nature, he keeps saying that. Listen, let the cooler heads prevail. Let's talk, brother. Let's not fight. We are not enemies. We are all Americans together. What Lincoln keeps saying throughout the whole speech is we want to preserve the Union. If there's a problem with slavery, then let's talk. Let's reach a compromise. Lincoln is not, and a lot of people think about this, Lincoln is not a fiery abolitionist. He is not. His inaugural address shows that very clearly. Lincoln's primary goal is to preserve the Union. So as we go forward, uh, and later on we're going to talk about uh, the Emancipation Formation, and we'll talk about African American affairs during the Civil War, understand that these are all secondary issues. Lincoln wants to preserve the Union. When the fighting starts, his second goal then is to end the fighting quickly. He wants the war to be over with quickly. But he will, he's going to have the Union no matter what. As you can foresee that if there's two separate countries, they'll simply fight each other to death forever and ever and ever. Okay? So on that note, uh, let's take a look at the map. And this is going to be a map that deals with uh, secession and the progress of it and what states kind of secede first and how that progresses going into from 1860 to 1861.